going to read out of four different translations. There's the first one's out of the Amplified. Like a thorn that goes without being felt into the hand of a drunken man, so is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Okay, in this saying, the mouth is being compared to something injurious rather than useless. The fool employs it purposely to wound others or by the ignorant use of some sharp edged, edged word, he does, much, he does much mischief. Fools cannot be trusted for truth or wisdom. Drunkards hurt themselves with thorns. Fools hurt themselves with parables. They take up a sharp pointed saying and instead of turning it to account, only injure themselves with it, as a drunkard pierces his own hand with the thorn which he grasped. Drunkards, drunkards are insensitive to pain. Fools are oblivious to their ignorance. Since a fool has no understanding, he ends up using a parable to his own hurt, much like a drunkard too intoxicated to handle thorns properly and ends up piercing his own hand. Wisdom is only for wise men. That was in the Amplified. Now in the Passion Translation. The statements of a fool will, will hurt others like a thorn bush brandished by a drunk. And that word brandish means to wave or swing something in a threatening or exciting manner, to shake or wave menacingly. A fool. A fool would be. <laughs> the fool would be dumb enough to do that. <laughs> um, the message says, to ask a moron to quote a proverb is like putting a scalpel in the hands of a drunk. <laughs> when I read that, I, I just got like this visual. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Now the NIV. Like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. So misusing a proverb will be hurtful to yourself and others if you don't understand it. It is improper and unprofitable. It will wound one's own conscience and ruin the souls of others. Be ready to give an answer, but make sure you understand what you're telling someone or it will hurt them or, com or confuse them. Um, this is so true because when, you know, like if people ask you about certain verses in the Bible, I know for myself, if I don't really, if I don't have the answer, I'm just going to tell them I'll get back to you because I'm not going to just make something up and because for that very reason, it'll, it'll confuse them and they won't understand it. Um, and, you know, this reminds me, too, when pastors always, he always tells us, don't take my word for it, go study it out. So, all right. Anything? Any questions, concerns? <laughs> go ahead. Work or food, you know, that's the way most of my Most of my lessons were work-related at the beginning. I'm telling you, the guy that used to own the shop, uh, well, what did he call himself, an agnostic in our kitchen? One, he was in our kitchen one time. He called himself an agnostic, and, he, and it's almost embarrassing for me to say this, but he gave the God the one-finger salute. Of course, he had a couple of drinks in him. Ooh. Alcohol makes people do things that they don't normally do. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to tell you, as evil as he was, of course, we, I, we were all there at one time, in, yeah. one, in one degree or another. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if God poured some extra grace out on us, but, but uh, some of the things that he did, they, they fall right in, not only with what you're saying, but pretty much if I really focused in on work and the guy I used to work for, I could glean some of the things that he used to do. 
For instance, I said something really dumb. I said something dumb to him one time. I must have been having a bad day at work. He could have reamed me out so bad. Instead, he took me outside and he said, don't you ever mm -hmm. talk to me like that again in front of the people, in front of the other guys. Now, that's a quality. Yeah. Because it's real easy to open your mouth and just start letting, letting stuff come out. And another thing that he did was what you just said. If I had a question on a job, and he, maybe he didn't have the answer right away, mm -hmm. or he was busy doing something else, he would say, put your question right there. Yeah. Come back to me in a few minutes, and I'll, and I'll give you the answer to it. And then, which we don't experience, and, and we probably should, it would take us out of our comfort zone, me, it would take me out of my comfort zone. He would say, I'm gonna show you how to do this job, and then I want you to tell me everything I told you so that I, I know that you totally understood what I just said to you. Yeah. The guy was good, he, he really was good. He cut his life short. I really think mm -hmm. that uh, God could have used somebody like that because he was a very, you know, if, if I can use an oxymoron, he was uh, stupidly intelligent. <laughs> Kelly Varner had a had a great take on agnostic and atheist. The atheist says I don't believe. Then a theism against a form of God. He says I'm an atheist. It means I don't believe. But that becomes his religion because he believes that he doesn't believe. And that's what he worships. The agnostic, the Latin word is agnoeo, and it means to be ignorant. Doesn't mean to be stupid. Doesn't mean to be rebellious. It means I don't have enough information to make a right judgment. So. You either don't have enough information or you believe that there's nothing to believe. <laughs> okay, verse 10. Um, in the NIV it says, But like an archer who wounds all, so is he who hires a fool or chants passers-by. Um, the message says, hire a fool or a drunk, and you shoot yourself in the foot. So, I don't know what it is with the drunken person and a fool, but it's like every verse they're referring to, you know, the drunkard as a fool. Um, New Living Translation, Translation says, an employer who hires a fool or a bystander is like an archer who shoots at random. Um, we already we know what bystander is, a person who's present at an event without participating in it. Yeah. This proverb says that a careless, random way of doing business, taking into one service fools, or entrusting matters of importance to any chance loiterer, is as dangerous as shoot, shooting arrows about recklessly without caring where they flew or whom they wounded. Let's see, the Passion, uh, the Passion Translation says, like a reckless archer shooting arrows at random is the impatient employer who hires just any fool who comes along. Someone's going to get hurt. Um, this, this, this is reminding me of um, like nowadays, most companies do a quarry check on people before they hire them. So, I mean, obviously back then there was no quarry checks. <laughs> So they hired just anybody. But even, when, even with that, though, people can still get hurt. Let's see. Now I have the King James Version. The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. Okay. 
If this rendering of the passage could stand, then Matthew 6, 2 might be quoted in illustration of it. If fools and transgressors will set their mind upon husks, that's in Luke 15, 16, I believe, instead of the food God has provided for his children, he does not deny it to them. They have the reward they seek for. But the Hebrew can hardly yield this meaning. Of all the various renderings suggested, perhaps the most unobjectable is as follows. A master, one skilled in his art, produces everything. By his own care and oversight, he sees himself that is, is properly done. But a fool hires others to do his work and he hires passers-by, which is any casual person that comes in his way, whether skilled or not, and so the work is done badly. I had, a, I had an employer once who took on so much work and he didn't have enough people. I heard him say, I need warm bodies. I just need to man the job. I need warm bodies. They don't have to be able to do much. Just be there. Yeah. Okay. The Hebrew text of this verse will admit of different translations. Um, the word rab or rab, R-A-B, rab. Um, here is rendered great, may be applied either to God or to a prince. And the proverb may be considered as declaring either how God, the creator and governor of the universe, will deal with sinners, or how kings and princes ought to act toward their subjects. Um, then there's a, a paraphrase that I wrote down from Pat, Bishop Patrick. I don't know where I got that from. Um, the great God who made all things governs them also most wisely and equally dispensing, for instance, his punishments suitable to men's sins, whether out of ignorance or of willful wickedness, whom a good prince imitates, but a bad one proves a universal grievance by employing either fools or profane persons in his service who vex the rest of his subjects. Um. Then there's another scripture. The great God that formed all things, that made the heavens, earth, and sea, and all that are in them, who is great in the perfections of his nature and in the works of his hands, and greatly to be praised, both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors according to their works. Every transgression of the law, receiving its just recompense of reward, whether a man transgresses it ignorantly or willfully, as his transgressions are, whether through error or presumption, so, ha so shall his punishment be, though some understand this as, some understand this as kimchi, K-I-M-C-H-I, yeah. of the Lord's doing good in a pro providential way to the wise and unwise, the righteous and the wicked. The words are by some rendered to another sense, a great one grieveth all, and he hireth the fool, and he hireth the transgressors. That is a great man, a, a tyrann tyrannical prince, grieves all his good subjects. Or from the use of the word in the Arab, er, Arabic tongue, changes all things, inverts their order, or administers all at his will. That is wrongly. When he hires fools and wicked men to do those bad things for him, which others would not, to the great detriment of the commonwealth, and rewards them for it, putting them into posts of honor and trust, to the great grief and trouble of all his best subjects.
know, I thought about when you said um, earlier about the drunkard and the, and the fool. And as I pondered on, on the aspect, you gotta, you gotta understand, there's a difference between being foolish and being a fool. Mm -hmm. And you just read that, the portion of doing it ignorantly or willfully. Think about um, Nahab and Abihu, right? Aaron's sons. What did they do? They offered up what? Strange fire. fire st uh, strange fire before the Lord. And if you continue to read on, it says that mm -hmm. because God told Aaron, right, and told Moses not to do what? Anybody know? Not to do what? Bring strong drink or put strong drink to their lips. And Pastor always uses this as a principle about one of the reasons why we don't drink is because when would you ever want to be out of the presence of the Lord? All right? And that's not a condemnation on, on people that drink. What he's trying to bring you is into a, re, uh, uh, a revelation or a reality or um, a realization that being foolish, right, mm -hmm. and being willfully foolish or being a fool because you're saying no to God and I'm going to do it my way come you know what? And that's all he's trying to say. You think about that. We've done, I'll, I'll guarantee you, everybody sitting in this, in this room has done something foolish. But how many times have we done things where we were the fool, where we just put our heels in the mud and like a jackass and would not budge on our, our here we go, our position of what we thought was right and had no Holy Ghost movings whatsoever in any of it. There's really what the key is, what he's talking about. When he's dealing with foolishness and a fool. And I think Nahab and Abihu, that brings a principle. And it ought to bring a principle in our, our lives that when we move, when we walk, when we talk, when we do, remember yesterday's proverb? Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps his mouth shut. That's why they keep, that's why it's continually said, think before you speak. So you don't have anything foolish coming out of your mouth. Okay, moving on, Proverbs 26, 11. As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Yep. Uh, the message says, as a dog eats his own vomit, so fools recycle silliness. And if you go to second, you don't have to go there. Second Peter 2.22, it says, of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to his vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. The dog here in this verse is an emblem of those sinners who return to their vices. This is basically saying a fool repeats his stupidity. Many times, or a wicked man turns to his wickedness, who having had some qualms about his conscience for sin, for a while forsakes it. But that fit being over, and he's forgetting all his former horror and uneasiness, returns to his old course of life. A wicked man is here compared to a dog, as he is elsewhere for his impudence and voraciousness in sinning, and the filthiness of sin is expressed by the vomit of a dog, than which nothing is more nauseous and loathsome. And the apostasy of the sinner from an external course of righteousness into open profaneness is signified by the return of this creature to it. The fool never frees himself from the trammels of his foolishness. His deeds and words always bear the same character to the end. The same truth holds good of the sinner, especially the drunkard and the sensualist. If they feel temporary compunction and reject their sin by partial repentance, they do not really shake it off wholly. 
It has become a second nature to them, and they soon relapse into it. This verse may either declare how the Lord will deal with sinners according to their guilt, or how the powerful among men should disgrace and punish the wicked. Verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. We, we see many who have so little sense, but are proud of it. This verse describes those who think their spiritual state is good, but it's really bad. Now, these, these verses that I'm going to read next are from the Message Bible. Luke 18, 11. The Pharisees stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, yeah, adulterers, right. or even like this tax collector. All right. Praying it out loud while standing in a doorway. Yeah. So everybody could hear. Yep. Um, Romans 12:16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Revelation 3.17 You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Right. Proverbs 3, 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Nothing so shuts the door against improvement as self-conceit. Isaiah 5, 21 says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Such people professing themselves wise become fools. Romans 1.22, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. You know, as you're, as you're speaking, you're, you're talking about the fool and the drunkard and these despicable people that, God, we're not like that, <laughs> spoken of like the Pharisee. I'm not like them. Thank you, God. Yeah, we are. <laughs> but so in truth, we are but a breath away from being that. And we talk about obeying the Lord, you know, and, and all of this sanctimoniously holy stuff. But the truth of the matter is, obeying the Lord only stems from being consciously aware of the Spirit. Because it's so easy to go into my daily life activity. And have something set me off to an attitude or anger or something that would allow me to slide back into a position that I just put my nose up at somebody else because they did. So Walking in obedience is a wonderful term and a wonderful thought. But unless it starts with the realm of awareness, unless you're, you're consciously aware of the realm of the spirit and the realm of the spirit around you and the realm of the spirit within you, that's the only time you can obey and do right because we're just a decision away from making a fool of ourselves, mm -hmm. from doing something stupid. And then we get all self-condemnation and upset because we did that and, you know. 
I, I just happened to read that. You, you were reading along, and I remember I was reading something. I don't remember what it was, and it said, oh, we have to obey, you know, the spirit. Well, if you're not consciously aware of the realm of the spirit around you, that's why he says we need to be walking in the spirit. What does that mean? Just taking our daily life one step at a time in a conscious awareness. I mean, we don't have to go around work, hands in the air, praising God at the top of our voice. But we do need to understand what would cause someone else to stumble. Hand is up. <coughs> Confession. A little bit. <laughs> um, I had uh, this whole thing. I've been. Ha I had a, been having situations. I should say. Rise up, and um, some of it wasn't good. Some of, well, actually, none of it was good. But um, through the whole thing. I had an incident yesterday where I was, could have wailed off my mouth, wanted to, but I didn't. I sat there and I had to listen and then I had to speak a word and then I had to calm myself down. I was inside, I was so angry. So I had to, at the whole bit, so I had to just calm down and just sit there and kind of kept praying and praying and praying because it was awful and um, got home and cried my eyes out and then the Lord was showing me things on the way home and um, but even before then I was in situations in my own home my own apartment now that I've had where I was angry at myself for letting things affect me and the Lord would I'd have to sit in a bed and he would just show me things you know my spirit was fine but my emotions were going off so because i was so angry at myself and beating myself up but i'm learning little by little after i moved even before but after i moved to um really listen to the lord and listen to what's going on and just kind of watching my emotions that's what I think it's really about, emotions and learning how to control them and learning what Brother Bud just said, you know, with the spirit. So it's getting there and it's wisdom and discernment and, and just really, um, I don't want to say it, it's just really kind of trying to calm your emotions down and so you can hear clearer, clearer in the spirit as to what the Lord's trying to say, you know, and, and, and it's just kind of all of that at once, I think. It, it can get very overwhelming, and it was, but I was able to see in the midst of it what he was doing, kind of, sort of, so getting there. <laughs> Chris spoke a good word Thursday, and he used, he talked about the whirlwind. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are times in our lives when it seems like everything is going wrong. That you, you're saying, why God? Why God? Why is this? <laughs> Knowing all the time that there's nothing that you can do of yourself, of your own self, to correct it. So the whirlwind is gonna come. The thing is, can we hear the voice? in the whirlwind and not get caught up in emotion because emotion just automatically erases anything that's that's of any wisdom it, yeah it just it just overruns it and 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 I know that the first thing you have to check stop the emotional outburst or the cry and be still be still and know that I'm God there's a whirlwind okay what's being said in that whirlwind you know what's what's being said to you 
Maybe it's not even having anything to do with the situation or those involved with the situation. <coughs> that whirlwind is their do. They have to hear God in themselves for that whirlwind. But you have to hear what's going on here. Totally off track, right? Now. Well, continuing. Um, in the Message Bible, in Proverbs 29, 20, it says, Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for him. A fool who is conscious of unwisdom may be set, set right, but one who fancies himself perfect and needing no improvement is beyond cure. His case is hopeless. There we go. <laughs> Nothing wrong with me. I'm just, yep. I'm fine, perfect. <laughs> so the sinner who feels and acknowledges his iniquity may be converted, but the self-righteous Pharisee who considers himself to have no need of repentance will never be reformed. Um, Luke 15, 7 says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Luke 18, 14. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Um, I, I looked in Gill's expository. I don't know if you've ever read. And it says, Seest, see, seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? or in his own eyes, as multitudes may be seen by looking around. Man is a creature but of small knowledge in things natural, civil, mechanical, philosophical, moral, or divine, yet greatly conceited for the most part of his knowledge and wisdom. As by a fool in this book is generally understood as a wicked, profane man, so by a wise man is meant as good and righteous only their own conceit and esteem, not truly so. They place their righteousness in outward things, in the observance of external duties. And though there may be some little imperfection in them, yet they think, as they mean well, God will accept the will for the deed. And some have imagined that they have arrived to perfection, and such are generally conceited, proud, haughty, and despise others, all which flows from ignorance. For though they fancy themselves to be wise, they are very ignorant of themselves, of the plague of their own hearts of the law of God, and the spirituality of it, and the extensiveness of its demands, of the strict justice and righteousness in the room of a perfect one and also of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the nature and necessity of that to justify. And this being their case, they are in very dangerous circumstances. They are building on a sand. They are liable to fall into a ditch. They cannot be justified nor saved by their own works. They oppose themselves, themselves to God's way of justifying and saving sinners and he sets himself against them. He resisteth the proud. Wherefore, there is more hope of a fool than of him, of a profane sinner than of a self-righteous person. For Christ came to save sinners, to call them to repentance, and he receives them as such, but not self-righteous persons. And humanly speaking, there is a greater likelihood and greater hopes of convincing sinners and bringing them to repentance and to forsake their sins than there is a, of convincing a self-righteous man of the insufficiency of his righteousness and the folly of trusting to it and of bringing him to repent of, of such a confidence and to forsake it. For it is most natural to him. It is his own. And the effect of great labor and pains and encourages vanity and boasting, which would be ex excluded should he be part with it. Um, 
when I think of the self-conceit, uh, self it reminds me of the word haughty. And in Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. God is in control. We may think that we are in control just because we have power or, or success, such as a title at work or living in a huge house in a rich neighborhood. An example of this pride is in the book of Obadiah, when speaking of Edom, verse 1 through 4. Um, it says, We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise and let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will, I will let you down, declares the Lord. Fools have haughty spirits. Um, what time is it? Just 20 of. 20 of. Okay. Um, Oh, okay, I'll read Proverbs twenty six thirteen. I think I have time. The slothful man saith, There is a lion in the way, a lion in the streets. Now about the slothful man, it says, In this and the following verses, three degrees of sloth are represented. The first is when a man is loath to stir out of doors about his business in the field. The second is when he is loath so much as to leave his bed. And the third and highest is when he will scarcely put his hand to his mouth. Um, and that was Proverbs 13, 14, 15. Um, but I'll still go through them by which the wise man admirably sets forth the incredible laziness of some, which increases upon them continually, if they will not shake it off. And yet, so presumptuous are they withal, that they laugh at those who take a great deal of pains to be wise, and fancy themselves much wiser, because without any pains, they can find fault sometimes with other men's works. Uh, Matthew Henry's commentary says, The slothful man hates everything that requires care and labor. But it is foolish to frighten ourselves from real duties by fancied difficulties. This may be applied to a man slothful in duties of religion. <coughs> there is a lion in the way, a lion in the streets. In the way to his field or vineyard and in the streets where his business lies or leads unto it, a very idle, a very idle excuse this, since lions are usually in woods, forest, and desert places, and not in public roads, and much less in streets of cities. This may be applied to a man slothful in the duties of religion. The way and streets may denote public ordinances, which are the ways of God's appointing, prescribing, and directing to and in which good men walk and find pleasure and profit, and are the streets where wisdom cries, or Christ is preached, and where he is sought for and found. But many are the excuses some men make not to attend them. In Luke 14, 17, a certain man made a great supper and bowed many, and sent his servant at supper to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make an excuse. Though they are vain, frivolous, and foolish, as this here, for in these ways and streets may true seen the feet of the messengers of peace, hear the turtle's voice, 
the joyful sound of salvation by Christ may be heard. Here, the Lamb of God is, in, is directed to, to be looked at as taking away the sins of men, having been slain and having shed his blood for the redemption of them. And though the terrible voice of the law may be sometimes heard, which is necessary to arouse and awaken sleepy sinners and unhinge self-righteous persons from a dependence on the works of the law, yet afterwards comes the still small voice of the gospel, proclaiming freedom from the curse and condemnation of the law by Christ. Indeed, in some ages, there have been violent persecutors compar comparable to lions, and informers have been in the way and in the streets to terrify saints from their duty. But none of these could move them from it, nor separate fully gracious souls from their love to Christ, though carnal slothful professors are offended when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word. These are lions to them. And in times of peace and liberty, they can paint lions very terrible to themselves and raise such difficulties as are insuperable to them. A slight disorder of body, a small inclemency of the weather, little danger of catching cold, and the like, oh, and the like shall be a lion to them, not considering they have a devouring lion nearer them in their houses, chambers, and on their beds with them. Yep. Even Satan in those clutches they are, who keeps their goods in peace, by whom they are led captive and to whom they fall a prey, nor fearing the wrath of the king of kings, which is as the roaring of a lion, the wrath of God and of the lamb, who is also the lion of the tribe of Judah, and whose day of wrath will be such as none will be able to bear. Stop right there. You're thinking the... Uh The sluggard said, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the street. Yeah. Lions, like, as you say, like to stay in the woods or in the fields or in the desert. They don't like to come around where there's activity. So it means the sluggard is not being active yeah. on his path. But what does the scripture say about a lion? What does the scripture say about the devil? He goes about as a roaring lion. Uh -huh. yep, seeking. seeking whom he may devour. So it looks like the devil has come to this road because it's not active and he's getting ready to devour the sluggard. 